Hi, my name is Joanna Good and I'm a professor of education studies at the University of Oregon. Today I'd like to talk about computer science, education, and race, particularly at the high school setting. We all know that computer science has changed the way that we live in this world, the way that we teach and learn, the way that we do banking and financial aid, the way that we communicate with colleagues and friends and loved ones. And yet, very few people have the opportunity to study computer science, particularly at the high school level. In Oregon, where I live and work, less than 200 students took the Advanced Placement Computer Science test last year. Out of these 176 students, only 16% were girls, two students were Native American students, and one student was African American. Not only do we have a problem with very few students taking computer science in high school, but these numbers tell us that the diversity of this population is very troublesome. Nationwide, these trends continue. 20% of test takers in the US last year were females, and only 13% combined were African American, Latino, or American Indian students. So we have a twin problem of very few students studying computer science at all in high school in a field that really pervades all of our lives, as well as very few minority students and girls having the opportunity to study this important discipline. In our book, Stuck in the Shallow End, we chronicled why there are so few students of color and females taking computer science in the high school level. And we found there were two different strands of reasons that students didn't have access to this knowledge. The first was largely structural. We examined computer science offerings in three different schools, in a white community, a Latino community, and a middle-class African-American community in Los Angeles. We found only the white and privileged school had opportunities in rigorous computing, such as advanced placement computer science. And the other schools really had low-level computing, keyboarding, and simplistic programming assignments that were not rigorous, challenging, or socially relevant to students' lives. We also found that none of the teachers we interviewed had access to pre-service or professional development in computer science. So some teachers had content knowledge, some teachers had pedagogy, but it was hard to find teachers who had the preparation to have both pedagogy and computer science content knowledge in ways that effectively reach children. We also learned that schools didn't prioritize computer science and finding space in the schedule was difficult. So the more privileged schools had more creative ways of opening opportunities and the schools that were lower resourced and had the most high stakes testing pressure really didn't offer very many opportunities for students. The other strand we found was that belief systems played a large role for funneling students into these courses or keeping them out. So counselors often use their own belief systems about who belonged in computer science classes, who should be doing programming or coding, and these belief systems often geared only boys and only white boys towards these courses. We found some girls, for example, a Latina I spoke to at one school, wanting to take another semester of programming but instead being funneled by the counselor into a floristry class because that satisfied the same curricular graduation requirements. The findings from this book really pointed that we needed to have a different paradigm for computer science education if we really wanted to both increase access but more importantly broaden participation in computer science courses. The paradigm that we've historically functioned under is identifying the best and the brightest um, using belief systems that are shaped by um, people who have founded technology historically in our past and been celebrated and ignoring contributions of other people. So the best and the brightest tend to be identified as male students who have a natural inclination towards computing. However, we discovered that this national, natural inclination is more a result of preparatory privilege. Robotics kits underneath the uh, Christmas tree or being sent to computer camp and not necessarily an indication of student ability or their only indicator of interest. And if counselors and teachers just ended up perpetuating preparatory privilege, we don't have ways of providing more access to computer science for all students. 
Instead of this pipeline ed metaphor of putting kids most likely to succeed or go into very prevalent high paying jobs in computer science, I propose a more democratic approach to computer science access. Certainly with the computer science changing our lives, all students need to be able to understand what computer science is, how people design and build these technologies, what the ethics of computing are, and how computing shapes their own lives. Students need to be informed future voters in which they can have reasonable understandings of net neutrality, of privacy, of security, um, security problems, and other issues that really shape our lives and we need to be able to, with some good understanding, vote for elected leaders who will address these concerns and provide a common computer science knowledge for its citizenry. To meet this new paradigm of computer science education, we've developed a new course called Exploring Computer Science that is aimed at providing all students access to computer science knowledge, beginning with problem solving, human computer interaction, moving into web design and programming, and then finally applying some of their knowledge with data analysis and robotics. This new course, Exploring Computer Science, also puts forth the idea of computational practices, understanding that the content itself is not sufficient to understand computing, but being able to collaborate, communicate, use algorithms, create artifacts, and analyze the artifacts of others, build things, tinker, and follow their curiosity. These are all practices that we want to instill students along with an understanding of the computer science topics at hand. In order to support teachers in teaching and exploring computer science, teachers need to be able to have an inquiry-based pedagogy that allows students' curiosity to be the beginning point, turning that curiosity into instruction and application around computing. Our professional development program requires 14 days across two years for teachers to build these skills, to understand computer science, and to discover the best pedagogies that bring computer science to traditionally underrepresented students, along with students with disabilities, English language learners, and really all of America's students. Part of the professional development is a teacher-learner-observer model, where teachers practice teaching these lessons to one another, debrief the lessons as a community, and talk about how they might adjust the lessons for their own demographic group of students to pique the student's interest and teach the content alongside. We found from professional development, not surprisingly, that the biggest takeaway for teachers is being part of a professional learning community, where they're not the only computer science teacher in their department or school, but part of a general computer science teaching community, district-wide, statewide, and nationwide, that is bringing this important democratic knowledge to our classrooms. So as computer science reform efforts sweep the nation and more people, more government associations and industry are interested in bringing computer science education to the schools, we need to remember that we're not just about building the future workforce, but we're about creating a democratic citizenry where all students have access and opportunity to study the basic computer science knowledge that underlies the technologies that we use every single day.